Maybe you've heard this. If we look at the carbon dioxide, now you know carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, and the burning of fossil fuels, plus a little bit, maybe 15%, from cutting back into the rainforest, causes, uh, according to the simple models, causes global warming. Uh, the carbon dioxide tends to trap the heat radiation of the Earth. It's like putting on a blanket. It becomes a better blanket when you add carbon dioxide. I don't think this is in dispute. There is an uncertainty because when you increase the carbon dioxide and make the temperature rise a little bit, this causes water vapor to evaporate, more water vapor than you would have otherwise. That enhances the greenhouse effect, but it's believed not to enhance cloud cover. If it enhances cloud cover significantly, then all the calculations are wrong. Everybody admits this. This is not a contentious issue. If you look at the, the IPCC, this is the big UN panel, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This is, when people say there's consensus, that's what they're referring to. And they say, state in their report, and you can read the summary report, it's only about seven or eight pages, and it's available on the web. They, they, they're very clear about the fact that cloud cover is the biggest uncertainty. And if cloud cover were to increase by 2% in the next 50 years, we wouldn't have global warming. So that's the big unknown. And as you'll see, if you believe that you can get favors from God by praying, <laughs> then I suggest you pray that cloud cover will kick in. Because my evaluation is that when I show you what the problem is, if the global warming models are right, I think they're very likely right, then we are going to have global warming. And there's nobody proposing any solution about what to do about it. And I can't think of any solution. My op-ed piece in the Wall Street Journal showed what would happen if the treaty were signed and everybody actually abided. So this is the dream scenario for the Copenhagen Treaty that didn't get signed. This is what the law would be if President Obama had signed it. So what I've done here is here's the United States, down here, about six gigatons per year, and it started decreasing, cutting out going down to 20% of its emissions over 50 years, 40 years. Okay, so this, that's what we were going to pledge to do. What about China? They would cut their emissions intensity by 4% per year. So put them together with India, this is what would happen to them. Now wait a minute, it's supposed to cut. Well, why is it going up? The key word was emission intensity. I, I, I watched the news hour on PBS. And they said, and China has offered to cut its emissions by 4% per year. I went, oh god, even the news hour left out the word intensity. What does intensity mean? It's a technical word. That means if your economy grows by 10% per year, then your emissions are only allowed to grow by 6% per year. You compare it to the growth of the economy. That's what, that's what they were offering. Now their economy has been growing at 10% per year. Not quite for the last year, but for the last 20 years, the average has been 10% per year. 20 years of 10% growth. That's not a bubble. They're just catching up. They're simply becoming modernized. It doesn't require new technologies. It just means to really modernize their economy. So it's been doing this for 20 years, and I believe it can do it for another 20 years. If they do it for another 30 years, then their economy will still be half of ours per person. So there's a lot of room for them to expand and modernize. So let's say the treaty was signed and their economy continued to go at 10% a year, but their, but their emissions only grew at 6% per year. And this is what you get from emerging economies. And then I have them in the year 2040 deciding now that they're half of the value of the United States per person, half of our GDP, assuming we haven't grown. Now they can start cutting too, and that's why I showed that little notch up. So what you see here is in the very near future, the carbon is coming from the emerging world. To whom a lot of people believe they have every right to do this. What it shows is that no matter what we do, it's irrelevant. Hey, I'm a Prius. Now, some Berkeley audiences, that makes them cheer. It makes me laugh that they cheer. Because no matter what I do, I'm not solving the problem. It's a little bit like saying, there's a, you hear about world hunger. And so next time you see a beggar, you give him 50 cents instead of a quarter. And now you feel good. You've done something. No, you haven't done a thing. You've done a feel-good measure. So much of what I hear at Berkeley consists solely of feel-good measures. 
hey, we're going to cut back. And no limits on the developing world. And we're going to cut back. And what that means is out here, we're very likely to have a lot of global warming. But we'll be able to say at least it wasn't our fault anymore. Okay? I am a problem solver. And I say that any solution anybody proposes that doesn't address this issue is not addressing the problem. Now, OK, hey, we'll set an example. We'll buy Tesla Roadsters. We'll all go battery. We'll buy the $40,000 Chevrolet Volt. Will that solve the problem? No, because no China person can afford a $40,000 Chevrolet Volt, let alone a Tesla. So this is the sort of thing that makes us feel good. We can be smug in California because we use natural gas. And that has half the CO2 emissions per gigawatt hour that uh, they have on the East Coast where they burn coal. So we can feel smug, but are we addressing the problem? Not unless we're trying to find natural gas for China. So this is what nobody says. Now what about the climate gate? The scientists have now been exonerated, acquitted, not guilty. They did get a wrist slap. They deceived the public, and they deceived other scientists. But they did nothing that was immoral, illegal, or anything like that. What did they do to deceive the public? This is in the report, this is in the review, not the charts. But these are the data as they published it on the cover of the World Meteorological Organization magazine. These are the data that many of my fellow scientists at Berkeley use. They say, well, you know, the public may not understand graphs, but I do. And look at this. Here's the temperature for the last thousand years going all over the place. It's not actually temperature, but actually measure tree rings and sea and corals and things, but it's a proxy for temperature. It goes all over the place. And look what happened recently. Zoom. That's clear and incontrovertible. The public may not understand this, so I have to now lend my prestige to this. I'm a professor of physics, and I will now go and tell people that global warming is clear and incontrovertible because I have seen the actual data, and it is. And unfortunately, a lot of my colleagues have behaved in this way. In their paper, if you dig into it, they said they did some things with the data from 1961 on. They removed it and replaced it with temperature data. So some of the people who read these papers asked to see the data. They refused to send it to them, the original raw data. Um, they used the Freedom of Information Act. The Freedom of Information Act officer, on the advice of the scientists, would not release the data. Then the data came out. They weren't hacked like a lot of people say. Most people who know this business believe they were leaked by one of the members of the team who was, who was really upset with them. So now I can show you what the data that they refused to release, the original data, before they did anything. What they did was, and there's a quote. A quote came out of the emails, these leaked emails, that said, let's use Mike's trick to hide the decline. That's the words. Let's use Mike's trick to hide the decline. Mike, who's Michael Mann, said, hey, trick just means mathematical tricks. That's all. Now, and my response is, I'm not worried about the word trick. I'm worried about the decline. What do you mean, hide the decline? Let me show you this. Now we have the data. Now it's been released. And this is what it is. That's the raw data as any Berkeley scientist would have published it. They would have said, OK, we've had this medieval ice age, and now we have global warming. And there's some disagreement, but hey, there's disagreement all over the place. And that just shows the technique isn't completely uh, reliable. What they did is they took the data from 1961 on, from this peak, and erased it. What was the justification for erasing it? The fact that it went down. And we know the temperature's going up. Therefore, it was unreliable. Is this unreliable? No. How do we know? Well, we don't know, but uh, <laughs> this is probably some human effect. This, the, the justification would not have survived peer review in any journal that I'm willing to publish in. But they had it well hidden. And they erased that, and they replaced it with temperature going up. And let me show you how cleverly this was done. They, it, it, you get back to this plot. There it is. Uh, they added the same temperature data to three different plots, giving the illusion that there are three different sets going up. Um, and they smoothed it. This temperature changes smoothly. If they hadn't smoothed it, you might have thought, wait a minute, what's the change going on right there? Why is it abruptly different? But you don't know the fact because it's smooth, but smoothing is legitimate in their minds because the temperature change is not discontinuous. So that's what they did. And what is the result in my mind? Quite frankly, as a scientist, I now have a list of people whose papers I won't read anymore. 
You're not allowed to do this in science. This is not up to our standards. I get infuriated with colleagues of mine who say, well, you know, it's a human field. We make mistakes. And then I show them this. And they say, uh, no, that's not acceptable. Now, here's part of the problem. The temperature I showed you before, this one, of the three groups, I picked the one I trusted the most. Guess which group this was? Yeah, the group that did the decline. So we have Jim Hansen who predicts things ahead of time, what he's going to find. We have the group here that feels it is legitimate to hide things. This is why I'm now leading a study to redo all this in a totally transparent way. Okay. I want to finish in about five minutes, a little I say. I mentioned the IPC thing, CSA, the problem with him laying late. Their, their next report is going to be much cleaner and much better. They, they, they've taken such a blow. Because it wasn't just the Himalayan glacier. Uh, it was this long list of things. All the things that really grabbed the newspaper headlines were not based on science. That's not surprising. They're not in a discovery mode. They're in a reporting mode. So, so um, they're in deep trouble. They, they, their chairman will have to resign or be fired. And they, they, and they need to report now that they need to clean this up this act, and they will. The result will be the next IPCC report out in about two years will not have the spectacular headlines that the previous ones have had. We'll have rather dry science. That's what I predict. 